was Father's Day, and I uh, wanted to introduce you to my dad. This is a picture, well, two pictures of my dad, one from about 1987, uh, and then the other one, this is from a few years ago, uh, his name is Steve Watson. There in the picture on the left, you can see he's probably in his mid-30s, 36, 37, the dapper young man in the gray sports coat and the white turtleneck, that was me. <laughs> and uh, so you can see, Dad, you can see we have somewhat of a family resemblance. I have two other brothers. All of us have the same hairline as Dad. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a, a funny story. When, when my brother uh, Josh and I, we were in college, one day I still had hair at the time, and Dad went off to church. I, I wish I had this picture. There, there's a picture of it. I should have brought it. But Dad went off to church, and we shaved our head into, uh, like him. So we walk into church, and the top of our heads are bald, and we just have the hair around here. And he, he just about died. And, uh, <clears throat> but I, I love my dad. I love my dad, and uh, I love giving him a bad time. But he is a, he's a good, good man. He has uh, been a pastor my whole life. And I'll tell you, like... It's not just the hairline that has been passed on to me. My dad, because of the way he's lived and because of the priorities in his life and because of the humility that he has, he has passed his faith on to his biological children. I remember dad like preaching and I remember the, the scriptures were always so important to dad. I remember dad being up in the pulpit, him talking about the Lord Jesus, and at points, like, he would get misty-eyed as in the, his mind's eye, he would hold, like, the, the precious truths of what God has done for us in Christ, and they were so close to his heart that they would come out of his eyes. I mean, that, that did something to me, even, even though I walked away from the faith, like, for my, most of my teenage years, I was not walking with the Lord. I ended up coming back to the Lord, and I think a large part of that was the influence of my dad. I remember my dad, and he uh, was not a perfect dad. There are no perfect earthly fathers, but sometimes he would lose his cool with us, you know, raise his voice. And I remember this man, you know, big, strapping, strong, powerful man coming and apologizing to a six-year-old little boy. Seth, I'm so sorry I lost my cool with you. Never hit me, but he'd raise his voice. And that just spoke volumes, not just about what he said he believed, but about what he actually deep down believed. And so I think in many ways, I'm a product of Steve Watson and Mary Kay Watson, my parents. They not only passed on biological traits to me, but also spiritual things. And that's interesting to me because not every, not every man in the room is maybe a biological father. Maybe you're not going to pass biological traits on to the next generation for whatever reason. But if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's this amazing thing that you can pass that on to the next generation of people. You can have, you don't have to have a family, a biological family, to have a lasting, eternal, ongoing impact in this world. And as we think about Father's Day this morning, I, I want to talk about this idea of spiritual fathering, spiritual guiding, as we're going to see in this text, because I think one of the things that ails us as a culture is that we have a deficit of spiritual fathers. And I'm not pointing the finger at anybody in here. I'm not saying like, hey, you guys are not doing it. I'm just saying like in general, as a culture, we don't have a culture of men who are intent on passing the faith intentionally on to others. And yet in the, the text we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see an example. And we're going to see some traits of this man who was intent on passing his faith on to others. And I hope that in that we would maybe, maybe answer the call. Maybe we are answering the call. But maybe in this God would challenge us and say, maybe you could do this, or maybe you could change this, or maybe here's something you could think about 
Or maybe here's something you could commit to prayer. Or maybe God would put someone on your heart or on my heart and he would, he would have us reach out and engage a person in a conversation or invite them to, to do something with us. Because I profoundly believe that our world needs what we have to talk about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's not one of the more famous parts, I don't think, of 1 Corinthians. There's 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. But 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 14 to 21 this morning, where the Apostle Paul is going to give us an insight into his relationship with this church in Corinth. And we're going to see four traits this morning of, I think, spiritual fathers, spiritual guides, people who, men who are investing themselves in others. This is on page 954 in the Bibles that are underneath the chairs. If you don't have a Bible, we'd invite you to take that one with you as a gift from us. We have a Bible reading plan Pastor Matt has put together, and we'd love for you to take that Bible, take that Bible reading plan, and begin to just open God's Word for yourself. My hope is that this is not the only time that you crack your Bible or open it on your app, but you would do that throughout the week. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 down to 21. I do not write these things to make you ashamed. I would say that this morning too. I'm not preaching this to shame anyone, but hopefully to spur us on to what God has for us. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills, And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? This morning we're going to see, I think, at least four traits. Maybe you could pull more out of there. Uh, But there's four big things that I see in here that are just imperative. If we are going to be spiritual fathers, whether we have our own children or whether we are building into the lives of others, four traits of spiritual fathers. So here's the, the first one, is that spiritual fathers... And I think this is foundational. This is at the the bottom floor. Like, you don't get anywhere else if you don't do this. Spiritual fathers love people well. Spiritual fathers love people well. They love people well. What What does that mean? It means that they are as much or more focused on the good of the other person than they are on themselves. They love people well. Paul introduces this category in verse 15 of a spiritual father. He uses the word. He says, For though, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he introduces this category of person. It's not just a biological father. Though that's a high and noble calling. This is a father, he says, in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What is, what is a spiritual father? A spiritual father is a person who is there at the beginning of someone's faith journey. They say often it takes someone a number of times of hearing the gospel for them to trust Christ. So which one of those? If it takes a person seven times hearing the gospel to trust Christ, which one of them is a spiritual father? If it's different people. I don't know how to answer that question, but I I do know what Paul is getting at is that he was there at the beginning of the Corinthians walk with Jesus. He was there at the very start. He was helping share the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross and rose, rose from the dead. He was there at the beginning. 
And so he calls himself a spiritual father. But it's interesting. He also introduces another category. He says at the beginning of the verse, verse 15, for though you have countless guides in Christ, so we have fathers in Christ Jesus, and we have guides in Christ. And he's kind of drawing a distinction between the two, though I don't know that it's that big of a distinction in practicality. If spiritual fathers are there at the beginning of somebody's faith journey, they're important in that. A guide in Christ is someone who kind of picks that up wherever they are and they help people grow in their relationship with Jesus. But I think it's, they're both part of the same class. It's one idea. Because if Paul were standing here today, I think he'd say, like, whether, whether I'm the first one to share the gospel with someone or I'm, I'm going to uh, help someone grow in their faith, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that I'm, I'm doing the work that God has called me to. So you have these two categories, but, but notice something else about the text, verses 14 and 17. And this is an interesting juxtaposition. Hold this in your mind as we get to the last, the last of the traits. Because the spiritual fathers love people well. They talk about the people uh, in, in this way. Look what he says in verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Spiritual fathers love people well. He calls them his beloved children. In verse 17, he comes back. He says, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, Timothy. In other words, he's giving us an insight into his relationship with them, with Timothy, with the people that he worked with. This is not to say Paul was perfect. I don't believe Paul was perfect. But Paul apparently had a warm, loving, kind relationship with the people with whom he worked. Paul apparently, he wanted the best for the people that he was serving. Paul apparently, in his life, he wasn't out to just take from the churches. He wasn't going around starting churches as some kind of multi-level marketing scheme. He was going around starting churches, sharing the gospel, putting his own life and his own body on the line in town after town as we read. Why? Because he loved the people. He cared about them. He wanted them to know what he knew, and then he wanted to see them grow in it. See, Paul loved people well. And I think that's a foundational trait of a spiritual father. Or if you're a lady, a spiritual mother. We talked about spiritual mothering on Mother's Day. But this is foundational. You don't get into the game without this part. Spiritual fathers love people well. So then there's a question, and uh, I fear to ask it because of the answer I know in my own life. Do I love people well? Do I love people well? Now, well doesn't mean perfectly. I'm imperfect. I have to apologize more than I would care to admit to my children and my wife and to others around me. But it's a question we need to answer. Do, do we, do I love people well? Spiritual fathers love people well. Spiritual fathers also have lives worth imitating. They have lives worth imitating. They have lives worth imitating. Look what he says in verse 16. I urge you, then, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. And you think about that as a statement. How, how many of us would have the boldness to say this to somebody else? Be, you know, you see what I do and do that. Most of us would maybe be a little bit uh, less bold than this. But Paul says, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. You think, well, man, I'm, sometimes I'm not worth imitating. Sometimes I screw up royally. There's a whole bunch of things that uh, people should not imitate about me. And yet Paul says, be imitators of me. Interestingly, though, I, I, was, I knew there's another verse. I, I'd forgotten about this, this verse, but there's another verse where Paul goes beyond this. He uses similar language, but he goes beyond this. So I went hunting for it this week. 
Like, where is that verse? Know where the verse is? I thought, is it in a different book? What, what book is it in? No, it's not in a different book. It's in chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. Look what he says. Be imitators of me. And it's interesting, in the original language, the original language is written in Greek. In Greek, oftentimes, it doesn't, like, they don't use word order like we use word order. Their sentence structure is different than ours. So they could put words kind of in different places in the sentence. It doesn't really change the meaning. However, our passage, be imitators of me, in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me, is identical. Which is somewhat of a rarity in the New Testament. But notice he goes beyond simply be imitators of me. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. What he's not saying to them is, hey, hey, you need to like the same sports teams that I like, be imitators of me. You need to be into the same hobbies that I'm into, be imitators of me. You need to like, uh, <clears throat> line up politically with the things that I'm into, be Im imitators of me. You need to read the same books, like the same movies, like the same music, be imitators. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is be Im imitators of me in as, and so far as I am imitating somebody else, the perfect one. Be imitators of me, Paul says. This isn't, this isn't to say, interestingly, that uh, the Corinthians and Paul always got along. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on, but in 2 Corinthians, we find this verse where the Corinthians, they're kind of, you know, there's people, and they, don't, they have disagreements, and they don't always get along, and the Corinthians and Paul were kind of going back and forth. That's what these letters are about. Look, look what they say in 2 Corinthians 10.10. 10. Somebody's quoted as saying his letters, that's Paul's letters, are weighty and strong. But his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Apparently, there are some people in the church in Corinth, they didn't like think that much of Paul as a speaker. They didn't think of him very well as a, a person. They didn't have great high respect for him. And yet, he tells them, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul had a life of faith worth imitating. It was real. They saw it up close, probably. They probably saw him lose his cool on a hot day when things weren't going his way and he was frustrated. And they probably saw him come back and, hey, man, I, I, I should not have done it. I'm so sorry. They probably saw him humble himself in that way. They probably saw him make mistakes and have to go back. They saw him, like, do all the things that are real to human life. And yet, he was dead set on one thing, and that was following Christ and becoming like him. So I think spiritual fathers are not perfect but they have lives worth imitating. And they can say, they could say to others, they could say, hey, I don't have it all together. You may like see glaring issues in my life, as the Corinthians probably were pointing out to Paul. But I am dead set on one thing, and that is following the Lord Jesus. And insofar as I'm doing that, imitate me. Spiritual fathers have lives worth imitating. Thirdly, spiritual fathers invest themselves and their resources, the things that God has put in, put in their hands, in others. In others. And I think this is where, for many of us, the rubber might meet the road. You know, we are a, we are a busy, busy people. We're probably as busy or more busy than at any other time in the history of humanity, which seems crazy because we have all these modern technological advances and conveniences. But we, we have, like, we're so busy. And as a guy, you know, I go to work, and I'm, I'm working hard at work, and then I come home, and I do family stuff, and then, and then you know what I, do, I like to do with my free time? I like to do me stuff. I like to pick up my camera. I like to follow the NBA finals that just got over. I like to do, do all these things, and none of those things are bad, but do I have space and capacity to invest in other people as well. 
Because spiritual fathers invest themselves and their resources in others. It's, it's fascinating to me. This is a little bit nerdy. Okay, it's a lot bit nerdy. I apologize. <clears throat> I read a book uh, a few years ago called Paul in First Century Letter Writing. We don't think of this. We think, we think you know, paper we can buy by the ream, and it's kind of cheap. You know, for $10, 20 $30, you can get a ream of paper, a whole bunch of paper. It's not, it's not expensive. A pen, you know, you could pick up. We, we don't think anything of pens. They're, they're cheap. We learn to read and write when we're in elementary school. Everybody here probably, you know, knows how to read and write. But that was not the case in the New Testament world. Paper was very expensive. Ink was very expensive. Paul more than likely could read. He was literate, but, but reading and writing weren't as connected as they are today. Because it was so expensive, there's a special class of people, they were called scribes, who knew how to write well, they'd been trained, they knew how to work with ink, they knew how to work with paper. And so, more than likely, Paul probably didn't write the letters himself. More than likely, he probably hired professional scribes to to write down what he was dictating to them. More than likely, it was this back and forth process. So this guy, uh, E. Randolph Richards, in Paul in First Century Lettering Writing, he, he went in and he took the, the number of like words and letters and he got like, what's the standard size papyrus roll and what would have been like a normal cost for a scribe. They, they can find this sort of stuff. And he's estimated, look, look at this, this is fascinating. He's estimated the, the total number of lines, you know, there's Romans, the 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, the percent of a standard papyrus roll. So 1 Corinthians took about one and a quarter papyrus rolls. The total cost in dinars, 19.16. Oh, oh, and the other thing, this is fascinating, that <clears throat> they probably would have written the letter, but then kept a copy for themselves. So that if, like, their letter got destroyed, they could re reproduce it. Or so that if they wrote back and they wanted to reference the letter, they would have the copy to reference themselves. So it's not just one copy. We're talking a couple copies. Come to about $2,100 in modern American dollars for this, just this letter. So we see, you know, maybe somebody underwrote it for, underwrote it for him. Maybe somebody in the church in Ephesus was like, hey, you really need to write that letter to those people. You need to tell those Corinthians what, what for, so I'm going to pay for you to write this letter. We don't know. But this was not a free, cheap, it, it, it was much more than the maybe dollar that we would invest to send a letter today. Significant investment of resources just to write the letter We see that Paul not only invested his resources, he invested his time. In Acts 18.11, we see that he invested a year and a half with these people. And when he went to Corinth, he wasn't like, there wasn't a church established. He was working and he was preaching and, and he was doing all this stuff. He was just all in. He invested his money, he invested his time. And in our text this morning, he, he sent his best people. He didn't hold that back in verses in verse 17, he says, That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. See, Paul didn't hold anything back from trying to help the Corinthians grow in their relationship with Christ. He didn't withhold his money. He didn't withhold his time. He didn't withhold other people. He was investing himself in tremendous ways in their lives and spiritual development. Spiritual fathers invest themselves and their resources in others. And I, I think about that. And what, are, what am I expending my resources on? Like, that's the way I talk. It's my stuff, my money, my time, my resources. Am I investing it in people and passing the faith down? Am I investing it just in myself? Lastly, spiritual fathers, hold people, hold others accountable. And I put in love because some of, some of you are like, uh, some of us might say that, yes, we got to it. Holding people accountable. That's what I'm talking about. And, and these two things, they have to go to, together. They hold others accountable, but not just like, you know, like, hey, you're screwing up big time over there, but they do it in love. With the tone of love, with the intent of love, 
Not with the intent of, hey, I'm going to point out where you are wrong. But with the intent of, I want you to see what I'm seeing because maybe then God is going to use that in your life to draw you closer to himself. They hold others accountable in love. Look at his tone. I mean, we don't think of this with the Apostle Paul. Later on, he's going he's gonna to go on and on about love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast in, verse, in chapter 13. But look what he says here. Look at, look at just his tone. It's a little bit edgy. Some are arrogant. Okay, that's not really a nice word. As though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. There's people in the church, they're opposing Paul. Paul's just calling it out. These, these people, they are on their high horse, they're arrogant. Verse 20, and then he kind of throws it down. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. Talk is cheap, but in power, what do you wish? <laughs> you choose. I love this. Shall I come to you with a rod? Or with love in a spirit of gentleness. And this isn't an abusive, angry, undisciplined man. This is a man who's very thoughtful. He's got his heart in the right place. He's invested himself and he has a relationship with these people. But he's come to a point where he says, hey, there's some things that need to change. If you're going to continue following Christ. And he's not afraid. He's not a coward. And he's willing to say. If you don't change it. I'm going to come over there and make you change it. Insofar as I'm able. And if you look at the back and forth. Of the, for the Corinthian church. We think what happened was the Corinthians. They wrote a letter to Paul initially. And then Paul responded with the letter of 1 Corinthians and sent it by way of Timothy. Timothy got there. He read the letter to them. He talked with them, answered their questions. And Paul did not, the letter did not get the response that Paul had been looking for. So Timothy goes back to Ephesus across the Aegean, tells Paul what had happened. Paul got on a boat and he went to Corinth. If you read in 2 Corinthians, there's a visit called Paul's painful visit. He goes to Corinth, and he brought the rod. He got up in their grill a little bit. He probably spoke the truth to them in a forceful, hopefully loving way. He calls it his painful visit. And then he went back to Ephesus and continued preaching. And then he writes 2 Corinthians. And the tone of 2 Corinthians is, is much different. See, there was things going on in the life of this church that Paul needed to address. So he was willing, courageous enough, because he loved them, to hold them accountable to what God wanted for them. Spiritual fathers love people well. Spiritual fathers have lives worth imitating. They invest their, themselves and their resources in others, and they hold others accountable in love. And so this morning on Father's Day, here's, here's my, my question. How can we be spiritual fathers and or guides? What would that look like? And uh, we have a guy on staff and he spends a lot of time thinking about this. And uh, I just want to invite Matt up here and he's going to share some thoughts about what this can look like. Because it's not hard. It's not hard, but it does take effort and intentionality. Thanks, Seth. Well, when Seth asked me about this, four people came into my mind immediately. Uh, one of them was my biological father, my dad. He wouldn't call himself a spiritual giant, but he was faithful. Faithful to getting me and my brother and my sister to church every week, and along with my mom. He was a good father, he was a good husband, and uh, he was a good provider, and he just made sure that we were on the straight and narrow. I can remember freshman in college writing him, um, it might have been on Father's Day, just thanking him for all the spankings I had gotten as a little kid. And I got quite a few. Uh, I've changed quite a bit since then. But, uh, but just grateful, as I looked around, grateful for how I was turning out in regards to what I was looking at around me. And just respect for others, loving others. So he did. Those four points that, that Seth mentioned, he modeled that. 
But then there was the spiritual fathers. And the first one that came to mind was Paul Dyer. He became my pastor. I was part of a small Methodist church, conservative Methodist church. And he came in, he and his family came from Africa. They were missionaries. And I can remember him, he had this little book, and he, I think he may have been the one that bought it for me. It's called uh, Change the World Through Prayer uh, by Wesley Duell. And uh, he had his, that thing had been read so many times, and each time he read it, he read it with a different highlighter. And he began to teach me some things about prayer, and he did. He just loved on me uh, and brought me into his family, into his life, and began to speak God's word into my life. Uh, and that was, that was a big impact. And then I landed at Purdue University, and it was Carl Clayton, who was the campus director of Campus Crusade for Christ. I was pretty young, hadn't understood really a lot to how to put uh, my faith in action. And here I came under his tutelage, his discipleship, uh, his spiritual fathering. And he taught me a lot about evangelism. He taught me a lot about discipleship. He taught me a lot about prayer. He taught me a lot about leadership. But he, that's where I got infected because God was that, was, that was a greenhouse in my life at Purdue University. God just grew me like, like nobody's business. And that's where I began to hear God's voice for ministry, for schooling, and uh, future schooling. And so, and Carl's still there today. Uh, he's fighting cancer right now, but uh, what a dear, dear brother and a dear spiritual father. And then there's Terry Robinson. I came on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ. Found myself, I grew up in a small white town called Gas City, Indiana. And I, my first year on staff, first two and a half years on staff, I found myself in Detroit. Um, and if you know anything about Detroit, it's very mixed di diversity in light of culture and ethnicity and that type of thing. And Terry was a black man and a dear, dear brother. And uh, he took this white boy, uh, young white boy under his wing and taught me so much about multicultural ministry, um, understanding the black community. I mean, he took some of my stupid questions and just, he'd laugh at them. And then he would speak truth into my life. But he really, really, he gave me a vision for diversity, a movement that was so diverse, it, it, I've never been a part of anything since. But those four men, one a biological father and three spiritual fathers, they infected me and had a big impact on me. And the big thing that stands out in the midst of all four of them was relationship. We had a relationship. And that relationship, they each one of them said, Matt, focus on your walk with God. Find other brothers in your life of whom you can spend time with around this book. Don't make it difficult. And in the midst of that, encourage one another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I've been sharpened over and over and over again. And then what's interesting, too, is God began to bring other people into my life, of whom many of them I've never met, and that's through books. And as I began to plod through some of these things, God began again to transform this mind of mine, and as a result, was transforming my character. And so I really encourage you, if this is something that uh, you'd like to talk more about, see me, but we also have something that we put together. It's called life on life and it's just a simple little tool that gives you just a simple little guide to how you can spend time with one other guy or two or three other guys or even like our wednesday night bible study that will start up again in the fall uh, just some guys getting together getting into the word together and spurring one another on it will do wonders for your walk with god and you'll find yourself being one of the if you're not already you'll find yourself being one of these spiritual fathers and leaving a legacy of other men throughout time thanks Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Yeah, talk to him. He's got tons of ideas. This, this is not hard. It is not difficult. It just takes uh, a desire and a willingness. You can meet around the, the Word. You can just get together to pray. Uh, I mean, this is not difficult. And whether you are a biological dad or not, I think God is calling us, each and every one of us, to be a spiritual father to others. And we have, uh, we got people on staff here. P Peter works with the youth. And we got these, this, 
team around him, Peter and, and others, and what do they do? They're investing themselves. Some of them are, you know, maybe seven, eight, nine years older than the kids that they're working with, the young people. But they're investing themselves. You can, you can do this. We can do this. And, what, and my, my question is, what if, what if the men of God saw this as our responsibility as much as the Apostle Paul did? I think that would take care of a lot in our world. So, Father, thank you for your example as our perfect Father. And I ask that you would help me, you would help us as a people, or as, as men in our church, that you would help us to answer the call. Lord, maybe it's just for one or two. Maybe it's for, a, for many. But Lord, I, I just ask that you would do something in me, do something in us, that we would be like Paul. We would be uh, dissatisfied. until we have passed on our faith to others or until you have, you have made us spiritual fathers and spiritual guides to, to all the people that you have for us to do that for. Lord, I just thank you for your word. Thank you for what you're doing. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.